Hello, I'm Roddy McDowell, and I wanted to take a brief moment to introduce you to a new film I've just completed called Fright Night. In 1985, Fright Night came out and was an instant ready-made cult classic embraced by fans. This fun and refreshing vampire caper sees the pairing of old-school horror movie tropes mixed in with the 1980s teen horror genre to create something truly unique and original. Oh, you're so cool, Brewster! <laughs> I can't stand it! Where we meet Charlie Brewster, who is sure that his new next-door neighbor, Jerry Dandridge, is a vampire who drinks the blood of his victims at night. The problem is no one believes him where Charlie teams up with old vampire hunter movie legend Peter Vincent to face off against the ghoulish and terrifying faces of evil. However, what about the version of Fright Night that could have been? Did you know that at one stage in the production, Charlie Sheen wanted the role of Charlie Brewster? Now that would have been weird, wouldn't it? Huh, wow. And what is the long and complicated history of Charlie and his supposed best friend Evil Ed that we don't see in the final film? And for that matter, is Peter Vincent even Peter Vincent? So today we are going to do a deep dive into the movie that Fright Night could have been. The Lost Version. The version that you've never seen. Trust me, I'm a professional. I've been doing this for a long time. So, let's check it out. So as always, in order to understand Fright Night, the version that could have been, we have to go back to the very beginning. Fright Night was the brainchild of filmmaker Tom Holland. He had previously written the script for Psycho 2, and after Fright Night would go on to direct the first Child's Play movie, as well as several Stephen King adaptations. So he's a filmmaker well established in the horror genre. It was while penning the script for the spy adventure Cloak and Dagger that Holland first thought about what would eventually become Fright Night. He imagined what would it be like if a horror movie fan discovered that their next door neighbour was a vampire. Yep, a simple but effective premise. So Holland took this premise and <gasps> did absolutely nothing with it. <laughs> Yeah, he left it, as he felt the story couldn't really go any further, as no one would believe this horror movie buff, and his claims that his neighbour is a vampire. However, a year later, Holland was sharing this idea that he had with the head of storytelling at Columbia Pictures, where suddenly it hit Holland, and it all made sense. Well, this horror fan would seek help from Vincent Price. So with that, Holland got to work on the script for Fright Night. Holland had to create two characters whom were important for the functioning mechanics of the story of Fright Night. Those being Charlie Brewster, the teenage horror movie fanatic who is sure that his new neighbour Jerry is a vampire, and Peter Vincent, based on Vincent Price and Peter Cushing, an ageing star of old horror movies who hosts a late night show called Fright Night, which broadcasts old horror movies. As Holland puts it, the minute I had Peter Vincent, I had the story. Charlie Brewster was the engine, but Peter Vincent was the heart. Something else that helped with the creation of Peter Vincent was the fact that at that time, horror movie hosts like Elvira were becoming a big thing. So this premise of having TV shows with horror movie hosts which show old school horror movies was actually keeping with the times. Fright Night also saw the modern horror movie American Teenager trope previously seen in modern movies of that time like A Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th, mixed in with the older generation of horror movies, particularly the Universal Monster movies and Hammer Horror. And so Holland wrote the script in just three weeks, and supposedly was laughing his ass off the entire time while writing it, and wrote it in a way for himself to direct it, as he didn't want another director to direct one of his scripts, after he wasn't happy with the final result of the movie Scream for Help, which he wrote. And it was because Holland had written the as mentioned Cloak and Dagger, as well as Class of 1984, that Columbia took a chance with him and assigned him to be director of Fright Night. I guess they felt they had nothing to lose. The character of Peter Vincent was actually written with Vincent Price in mind, but he wasn't interested in starring in horror movies, as at that time, he was starting to feel that this typecast had now been done to death. 
Roddy McDowell came to the recommendation of Columbia Pictures, in which he previously starred in fellow Tom Holland-related movie Class of 1984, and he was really enthusiastic to take the part. And incidentally, McDowell would invite Tom Holland to a party at his residence, where he did actually introduce him to Vincent Price, who was actually flattered that the movie was somewhat based on him. Chris Sarandon was offered the role of Jerry Dandridge, but immediately turned it down, as he didn't want to star in a horror movie or play a villain. But after reading the script, he fell in love with the movie and really wanted to do it, so he was cast. Charlie Sheen supposedly was really interested in playing the role of Charlie and really wanted to do an audition, but Holland just didn't think that he was right for the role. Now, Williams Ragsdale auditioned to play Rocky Dennis in Mask, but he lost to Eric Stoltz. But while auditioning for Mask, a casting agent remembered Ragsdale when it came to the casting of Charlie Brewster for Fright Night, so he got the role. Stephen Jeffries, who played Evil Ed, likewise also wanted to play Charlie Brewster. But his agent accidentally sent him to an audition for the role of the Gary character in Weird Science. Yeah, look, weird screw up, I don't know how that happened. But I swear you couldn't make this up. However, the casting agent at that audition, who I guess was also working on the casting of Fright Night, thought that Jeffries would be more suited to Evil Ed. Which at first, Jeffries was kind of shocked and sad that they saw him as this really weird, oddball character. But regardless, he was cast and gave a memorable performance. Now, it would make sense that changes would be made to the original script along the way, as the actors of Fright Night would often make suggestions and changes to the script. For example, Sarandon wanted a subplot that Jerry wants to keep Amy for himself because Amy was the reincarnation of his long lost love. A plot point in the film that actually doesn't really go anywhere. Jerry in the original script was more villainous and generally a really nasty piece of work. Sarandon wanted to humanize him and make the character slick and have class. I think Sarandon also adds tragedy to Jerry. As he puts it, Jerry longs for a normal existence. To give you something I don't have, a choice. Forget about me, Charlie. McDowell also added input to Peter Vincent. He saw him as a tragic character. An old actor from long ago, long past his glory, who was stuck playing the same character over and over again in his movies. His life, according to McDowell, is sad and pathetic, with Vincent being a coward in real life. But he finds strength not as this character that he's been playing, but as a human being, which I actually find to be a very powerful character study. I think that what helped with all this input, as well as things being changed and added, was the fact that there wasn't really any interference by the studio. Simply because they didn't believe in Fright Night, so they weren't really overseeing it. Fright Night was given a low budget and considered a movie that wasn't really going to achieve much. In fact, the movie that Columbia was really putting their money on for being a hit was the fitness club movie, Perfect, starring John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis, two huge actors of that time. By accounts, McDowell had his own video camera behind the scenes when the movie wasn't being filmed and that he basically made his own behind the scenes movie filming all the stuff that happened with the actors and the crew on set. But the funny thing is, no one knows what happened to this footage. <laughs> it's, it's probably out there somewhere. And while filming, Charlie Brewster actor Williams Ragsdale broke his ankle. However, thankfully the movie's Los Angeles shoot had wrapped up and the movie would be released with it becoming the well-loved classic that it is. With it also becoming the second highest grossing horror movie of 1985 after A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Whereas Perfect, the movie that Columbia was so sure was going to be the huge hit was in fact a huge flop. Yep, don't judge a book by its cover. Or in this case, a movie production by its actors or something like that. It's here we get to the novelization of Fright Night. The novel was written by splatter punk horror writers John Skip and Craig Spector. And the book goes into interesting, tiny details that the movie did not. And also keep in mind that back then, movie novelizations were a reflection on original early scripts, before drastic changes would happen. So yeah, we have the novel of Fright Night. 
a book that literally starts with the frustration of Charlie Brewster not being able to undo Amy's bra, as it's just too complicated. Yeah, this is literally the first few sentences of the book. One of the most interesting differences is a glimpse into Charlie Brewster's and Evil Ed's past. You see, there's a reason Ed is kind of mean to Charlie throughout the film and frequently picks on him. Simply put, because they were childhood best friends. In fact, Ed, or rather Eddie, would call Charlie Chucko. However, their friendship had somewhat come to a sour halt when Charlie started dating Amy in which Charlie was now spending less time with Ed, and, well, more time with Amy, which is what led Ed to becoming angry and resentful of Charlie. In fact, in the scene where Charlie visits Ed for how to survive a vampire encounter, Ed flat out tells Charlie to get lost. What I also find interesting about this concept of Charlie, or rather Chucko, and Ed being childhood friends, only to drift apart when Charlie starts dating Amy, is actually a plot that would be recycled for the 2011 remake. There are other tiny details, like the high school featured in the movie is called Christopher L. Cushing, which is a reference to Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing as well as the revelation that the father of the Brewster household isn't around because he divorced Charlie's mother. When Jerry participates in the mock-up test to prove to Charlie that he's not a vampire, Jerry seems to react badly to the supposed holy water, where Charlie gets ready with his cross. But this was just a joke that Jerry was pulling on Charlie. When Charlie is trying to have his way with Amy, he tells her that they've been going together for a year, but in the book, she corrects him by saying it's only been three months. The music being played at the nightclub scene was described as being Michael Jackson's Thriller and Duran Duran's Hungry Like the Wolf. And yeah, both those song choices actually really make a lot of sense. And after becoming a vampire, Amy is now left with a bigger, uh, quote, vampire chest, which Charlie is actually really happy about. <laughs> Another big change comes in the form of the backstory of Peter Vincent, where it's learned that his real name, get ready for this, is Herbert McCoolahy. Yeah, all this time he's really Herbert McCoolahy. And in the 1950s, he was something of a bit part actor, and yet he somehow won the role of Peter Vincent in a movie called Fingers of Fear. Yep, in this version of Fright Night, Peter Vincent isn't the character, but the persona. And as Vincent, he would go on to star in other classics like I'll Rip Your Jugular and Fangs of Night. In this version, Peter Vincent is less vampire hunter and more victim of the circumstances around him as he's thrusted into this adventure, when in actual fact, he's not a vampire hunter at all. It's just a part that he's been playing. Heck, once again, his name isn't even Peter Vincent, but Herbert McCauley. In the book, we learn that Jerry has been around for four centuries, and the subplot of Amy being a descendant of his former lover was nowhere to be seen, as once again, this was an element that Chris Sarandon himself came up with. Supposedly behind the scenes of writing the book, authors John Skip and Craig Spector only had one month to write the book. And to be honest, if you go and look at the reviews online, it's actually got rave reviews. Like everyone who loves Fright Night also seems to really love this book and sing its praises and highly recommend it. The book aside, some elements that aren't directly addressed in the movie but have been theorised over the years is that Billy Cole, who I guess is like Jerry's servant, who was originally written as a big bulky guy, actually has an intimate relationship with Jerry, and that Jerry himself is in fact part fruit bat, which is why we frequently see him munching away on fruit. Now, the most infamous deleted material associated with Fright Night was the alternative ending, where at the very end, Charlie and Amy are watching Fright Night, where Peter Vincent starts turning into a vampire on live TV, while addressing Charlie personally by name. Charlie and Amy are really freaked out. Cue the credits. This ending was definitely going for a more shock approach, something to really hit the audience over the head with, with them having quite the lasting impression of Fright Night. However, when you think about it, this ending really doesn't make sense, as it's never made clear if, if Peter Vincent became infected with the vampire curse during the battle with Jerry, and if so, does that mean Amy still has the curse, or if in fact Vincent was already a vampire the whole time? And if that is the case, then that really does not make sense. 
It's like Tom Holland saw the ending of The Howling, where the news reporter turns into a werewolf on live TV and thought to himself, yep, that's the ending to go with, but it doesn't really work here, so I'm glad that it was changed. As pointed out by several web pages discussing this deleted subplot, one of the greatest aspects of Fright Night is the friendship duo double act of Brewster and Vincent, and how their experiences make them better, stronger people. And the vampire transformation on TV ending just would have put a cloud over all of that. Yep, all that character development down the drain. Regardless, the Fright Night movie that we all know and love would be released and the rest was history. I mean, what else can be said about Fright Night other than it's a bona fide 1980s horror movie classic and it's perfect the way that it is. Yes, it's interesting to learn things like the backstory of Charlie and Evil Ed's friendship, but it's not really pivotal. Sometimes what you see is what you get and that is more than enough. I think the Fright Night novelization is definitely worth a read, and it also does seem to be available. So if you're a fan of Fright Night, then I would strongly recommend checking out the book. It gives you a deeper insight into the tinkering mechanics of the story. Anyway, I'm Minty, and if another story of Fright Night was ever written, then I would totally be up for a prequel about Jerry. That'd be kind of cool, you know, I'm sure he has a really interesting backstory. Anyway, see ya!